So I'm talking today about neuromorphic chips and our collaboration with Heidelberg, which I find very rewarding and very helpful. Let me give you a brief overview about where we are with our group. Um, I'm interested in that what, that's what brought me to the COVID dynamics and spreading dynamics, then information flow, spreading dynamics simply of the activity, but then also how information flows in the network, then we use information theory, then how is this shaped by local learning rules, how can we derive in principle local learning rules from information theoretic goal functions. Let, finally, I would call this infogenesis. That's our main topic on self-organization of living neural networks. I also want to mention a second topic that we are opening, which is this infodemic and pandemic uh, interactions with overlapping um, graphs. I want to open that because we are really looking for advanced postdocs who want to become great on these topics. So I'm also advertising here a potential open position with a lot of freedom. That's more I give this overview slide, but let's now dive into our new morphic shift. This is the slide that I typically give as an introduction, but I think we don't have to go into details here. It's a beautiful system, especially if you have someone in Heidelberg who runs it for you, which is, I think, one of the crucial links that we definitely need. Um, in my case, it's also Benjamin Kramer, who has been done a tremendous work to implement all these ideas. I would like to start with the motivation. So how did we come into that collaboration? It was still also with Karl-Heinz Meyer back then in one of the retreats at the beautiful lake uh, in Austria. And uh, we had just recently obtained some analytical results. And analytics typically means you have to make simplified assumptions. And these analytical results showed how homeostasis can tune a network to a bursty state or a more continuous state, but the networks that we had used was fairly simple. So putting that on the neomorphic chip was very, very helpful for us because then we could probe all of that in more realistic and more detailed neurons. Let me briefly show this uh, analytical results because I think they are kind of insightful and I have the time here now. So take homeostatic plasticity. Homeostatic plasticity has a goal to, to, so that every single neuron now maintains the internal activation rate R. And here's a sketch by Yves Marder. And uh, the idea is the following. This is a neuron, as you can recognize. If here the excitatory synaptic strengths are too weak, then the rate here of the neuron that's here in black one is too low. It doesn't, isn't as high as the target should be. So one increases the excitatory synaptic strength. They are larger now. The rate goes up and then the neuron reaches target rate. That is a self-regulation mechanism. Obviously, opposite is true as well. If the neuron spikes too much, it decreases excitatory coupling. And this is a very elegant learning rule because you can implement it completely locally. You don't even have to memorize like spiking enough in the past. You could think now, well, how does the neuron now memorize how much it has been spiking in the last hour or the last day or so, but it works without. So this is how one can update these excitatory synaptic connections. I call them alpha J, but not IJ, because it's only about um, the incoming synaptic strength. Like you can scale them all the like. You could, in principle, also adapt the threshold with the same rule. So how do we do that in practice? We assume that there's a small increase of synaptic strength if one is not spiking, so it's a positive contribution. And for every single spike, we assume that there is a reasonable decrease. And that all happens on very low time scale of hours or, or days. The advantage is it's really only local information required. The only, the only thing that the neuron needs to know is how much itself is spiking and then it adjusts its incoming excitatory synaptic weights or its threshold. There's no memorization necessary. So you simply have this drift of increasing your strength and to reset whenever they are spiking. You can implement it in a stochastic manner if you don't want to do that as continuous as in this differential equation. And you can, in principle, put also different targets rate, rates in every single neuron. It works on very different topologies. We ran it, for example, here on a topology where we had the axons locally grow and uh, the neurons then uh, distributed randomly. This is then how such a topology looks like. This is simply a random growth um, algorithm for axons. Putting that all together, we put it with fairly simple point neurons because we wanted to have analytical solutions for the stability and the collective dynamics. This is what comes out. We had a hypothesis, uh, which I didn't tell you yet, I showed it as a result. We changed, in addition to the homeostasis, we had a network of spiking neurons with homeostasis, 
And then we change the input from weak to strong input. And what you see here is the population spiking activity. This is a spiking activity over time of all the neurons that we, let's say, observe in the network. It can be, if you have very weak input, it can be very uh, bursty. There's strong pauses and strong bursts of activity. And then the stronger the input is, the more continuous the activity becomes. Um, <clears throat> so we have, in effect, here a strong excitatory recurrence, which leads to this burst and then pauses. Whereas if the strong input accounts for quite a bit of the, in, of the activity, then you get away with weaker recurrence, but also then more continuous activity. Why is that interesting? That's highly interesting because it is one, I think, very plausible explanation why in vitro experiments in a dish where these neural networks are completely isolated, they do always burst. I've never seen any in vitro system that would show continuous activity. They do burst. Some are more, some are a bit more continuous, with also smaller bursts between, but they're really different from what we observe in vivo. And here's in vivo spiking activity also from some 50 or more neurons. There is clearly not these pauses in the strong burst. And our explanation would be that the core reason is that these systems are isolated, have to generate all the activity alone. And these systems have continuous input from other brain areas, from sensor modalities, from subcortical areas. For a physicist, what one would say is that under homeostatic plasticity, it is then the input strength that becomes the control parameter of this collective dynamics. So in principle, we would have to tune that ourselves. We could have sent all the synaptic strength, but we didn't. All that we did is to change the strength of the external input. And by changing the strength of the external input, we make a network either more bursty or more continuous. For everyone into criticality and the like, this also then tunes and changes the computational properties of these networks quite tremendously. So now we have a tool also for the neuromorphic chip to set its working point from more continuous to more bursty by only changing the strength of the external input that we apply. We also have a prediction that's more for the medical audience here that if, the in, if uh, this really is the correct explanation, then one could be able to tune also in vitro networks to a more continuous state. But now to the application in the neural, uh, in the pneumorphic chip. We implemented a homeostatic like mechanism here, together with some STDP-like mechanism, basically mainly the left uh, half of this. And then together, as assessed, first of all, the computational properties in the new, on the neuromorphic chip. First of all, we could see the exact same tuning from, con I, I forgot to put that figure, it's so obvious, but we saw from continuous to burst activity exactly the same behavior as before, but now with realist, more realistic neurons than the simple, simple ones that we have. We measured then the storage and the transfer of information in the network. So as a transfer of information between pairs of neurons in the recurrent network, and they increase here uh, with decreasing strength of input. So this is the stronger input on the right-hand side, um, as in the plot before. This is the more continuous activity. This is the more bursty activity. The information transfer and the storage, they all go up. This is predicted from theory. And it's good to see that this also happens in this theoretical network. Information flow thus between neurons increases with this decreasing input, or one could say it increases the more bursty, the more recurrent the network also becomes. But then the question is, can we use that for computation? Every one of you has been looking to critical dynamics without wanting to stress it too much. So this critical dynamics often has been associated with these maximal uh, processing properties. Maximum does not necessarily mean it's optimal. And that's exactly what we set out to test. We wanted to know whether now in a task, we have also optimal performance on one or the other side. From this plot, you would expect that optimal performance is if we have weak input and the network goes more direction of this bursty state. What kind of task does one take? Well, I could ask it to, to distinguish apples from bananas, or apples from oranges, obviously. And, uh, or one tries to make it a difficult task. And what is mathematically a difficult task is it's if it's completely nonlinear and you have to remember all the past input. And the most simple, but still most, I mean, from the most, I think, elegant formulation of a complex task is what we call the n bit parity task. It's the generalization of the XOR. You basically ask whether the last n inputs in a certain window did that carry an even or an odd number of ones. 
So has there been even or odd number of spikes in a certain defined past window? And we can make this window short, medium, or long. The longer the window, if I give you a sequence 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and this is even a sliding window, the longer the window, the, difficult, the more difficult the task. So this is the result we find to walk you through that. So if the task is difficult, we look at the last 25 inputs. Then indeed the performance is better for a system more in the diversity regime. So also more close to critical with this strong re uh, recurrent dynamics. If the system, however, gets faced with a simple task of only the last five inputs, then that entire um, network shows better performance here if it's more in the continuous state. So it seems that depending on task requirements, there's not one optimal working point in terms of the collective dynamics, but it really changes. This is something we could demonstrate on the neuromorphic chip with Benjamin Kramer. And uh, really, I think, puts a lot of clarity into this entire question of what is the optimal collective state, the collective organization of such a network for information processing. So to summarize that past, the task performance depends on the strength of the input because the input via the homeostasis it, it tunes the result in recurrence in the network, and it seems that every task may have its own optimal working point. We're going to test that at the moment in experimental setups. This is just a few a bit of an overview. This is a big thank you to the group who has been contributing, and a big thank you to Benjamin Kramer, who very recently handed in his PhD thesis. Looking forward to your questions.